that I welcome everybody to the third annual, um, ed the third Edinburgh annual FinTech Law Lecture. Um, it's, um, it's organized by the Edinburgh Center for Commercial Law, which has a long history. And um, it's, uh, it comprises uh, nine uh, senior researchers and uh, lots of junior researchers and uh, uh, PhD students. The honorary, the honorary chair is uh, Lady Wolf, who will chair today's session as well. Uh, it's a, a series of lectures that started with uh, Lord Patrick Hodge, now the vice president of the uh, uh, UK Supreme Court, continued last year with a very distinguished British jurist, uh, Sir William Blair, Professor uh, Sir William Blair, who is um, also the chairman of the Mocomilla, and we continue this year uh, with a, a very distinguished a European jurist. So we are, and I am personally, um, uh, extremely delighted and honored to invite you today to attend uh, a lecture on algorithmic bias by Professor Katia Langebucher, who will be introduced to us by the Dean of the Law School and recently elected the uh, Joint Chair of the Global uh, League of uh, Law Schools, Professor Martin Hogg. Um, will after, after the introductions and um, after Martin presents the uh, speaker to us, we'll proceed with the lecture, which uh, uh, will be chaired by Lady Wolf. Uh, Martin, could I please ask you to uh, invite you to take the floor and uh, introduce to us uh, Professor Langebucher. Thank you, Milios, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, tech in general is certainly becoming a more of a feature of our lives at the moment. And uh, I think the format of this meeting testifies to that. We've all had to get very used to technology in our lives in uh, the past uh, few months over the last year. And we're doing it with uh, a more or less uh, a degree of adeptness at, at it. I think uh, some people are probably doing better than I am. But beyond the realm of general tech, the tech that we are using, of course, um, I think we are all as lawyers appreciative of the way in which um, technology is having a very big impact on society more generally. And I think uh, this lecture testifies to the importance of technology in the financial and banking markets. The FinTech lecture, which Emilio also is so instrumental in establishing, has become a major part of the commercial law centre's offerings in the law school, and it does show I think the good attendance today that um, the fintech and the various aspects of fintech and its interaction with the law is something that we as lawyers must be fully cognizant of these days and therefore it's always been very important for us to get um, a real expert in the subject of fintech to come and speak at these annual lectures and as uh, Emilio has said we had two distinguished speakers in the last two years Lord Hodge and Sir William Blair and I'm very pleased it gives me a great honour to introduce our um, speaker this afternoon, who's also an expert in the field, Professor Dr. Katja Langenbrucker of the uh, Goethe University de Frankfurt am Main. Um, she's an affiliated professor at Sciences Po Paris and a long-term guest professor at Fordham Law School, NYC, and has held positions in a, in a glittering array of uh, institutions around the world. Uh, her long uh, publication list testifies to her expertise on corporate banking and securities law. And I think anybody who has seen her CV and appreciates her reputation will know just how lucky we are to have her as a speaker this afternoon. So thank you very much, uh, Danke schön, Professor uh, Dr. Langebrucker, for making the time to come and speak to us this afternoon. What I think will be a very important uh, subject, FinTech and Fairness, regulating algorithmic credit scoring. Before I pass um, the floor to you. I shall pass now uh, to uh, Lady Wolf to say a few words as well. Thank you. Yes, well, um, thank you and, and welcome. And uh, since Martin has so ably introduced our speaker, I'll simply simply say something briefly about the, the, the centre itself, um, which is, uh, first of all, Edinburgh Law School, as you may have noticed from the reports, I think today, is not only the first law school 
uh, sorry, the, the, yes, the first law school in Scotland, the sixth in the United Kingdom, and I think is now within the top 20 or 25 uh, within the world. So it, it is a distinguished body. And the Edinburgh Centre uh, for Commercial Law is does a fabulous job at bringing together uh, a number of lectures and the FinTech annual lecture is one of them. And of course, not only do we have the best audience uh, having a look uh, through those attending, but we have speakers in this context of exceptionally high quality. And therefore, we very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. So we'll come in indeed, and please, over to you. Thank you so much, Lady Wolf, Professor Hawk, Professor Buleas, the Emilias, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's really a great honor um, for me to be able to speak to you today. Although I've already said I would have loved to be there in person, and uh, I hope we'll be able to do that at some other time. Um, so I would like you um, to kind of walk through an introduction to what's called algorithmic credit scoring with me. Um, I'll, I'll highlight some promises and um, some risks and concerns also um, focusing on data protection and on anti-discrimination um, and then focus on something which I've already um, worked a little bit upon but um, has gotten me more interested over those last uh, weeks, which is the institutional design of regulators. So, I don't know to what extent you're familiar with credit scoring at all. Certainly um, in, in Europe and especially on the continent, um, much less, I would say, than um, in the US certainly and probably also in the UK. Judging um, from the students, um, I'm usually um, explaining this too. So credit scoring is basically a grade you get. Um, and historically, such loan decisions were based you know, on a mix of all kinds of so it was uh, some quantitative information, certainly, but also a lot of qualitative information, such as did you go to church every Sunday or were you dressed appropriately, etc. cetera. Um, and, and obviously this entails quite a bit of um, risk of cognitive errors and you know, implicit biases distorting um, the real assessment of what you wanna know, because obviously at the lender, you're most interested in understanding is this person going to pay back the loan, usually that is. I'm saying usually because um, you might also be interested if you're more in the business of what's called payday loans of understanding, is this person at least being able to pay back some of the loan and some of the extremely high interest rates. Now, um, currently most established scoring agencies rely on a more or less fixed number of variables. And that can be free income, that could be past credit history. It, it's really a bit different and, and depending on the country you look at. So the US has a fixed set of variables. Germany um, has a more vague and indistinct set of variables. In France, it's hard to understand um, how they're scoring at all because they're not officially um, established scoring agencies. So that varies, um, but in the end, you get a, a standardized grade, so to speak, a standardized score. And on that basis, a lender is going to decide um, whether he's going to uh, hand out a loan to you at all and what the interest rate is going to be. Now, what I would like to talk um, about for a little bit today are novel scoring agencies. And they don't look anymore at this fixed number of input variables, rather um, they look at a huge amount of what's called alternative data. And so what could that be? Um, I've just listed a couple um, here at my, my chair in Frankfurt, um, together with my assistants, we have tried to come up with examples and zifted through you know, different websites offering such um, algorithmic or AI credit scoring. And so they look at all kinds of things. Now they might look at just usual web browser data, but they might also look at purchasing patterns. For example, if you open your Amazon or PayPal account to them, they might look at the location of the computer you use and then depending on what you kind of open up to them, they might look at your Facebook friends. They might look at the typos in your text messages. They might have a way of assessing the taste in music you like. 
Um, one example, and that was a, a German scoring agency, um, they checked out the type of letter, so the font found on your electronic device. Interestingly enough, they found a huge correlation for a long time, didn't understand why, until they figured out that the specific font they had found on a couple of um, laptops, probably, um, was linked to an online gambling site. So it's really interesting. And others look at the time, you know, you need to fill out an application. And another example, the diligence in charging your smartphone. So apparently those who, you know, charge more often, uh, more credit worthy than others. So whatever, that's just to give you an example about the data people look towards in understanding you and in, in assessing your credit worthiness. Now, then the idea is to establish correlations between input data and then a so-called definition of success. So usually that will be the probability of you paying back, but it could also be something else, right? Um, and typically what they do, and this is kind of the, the, the math slide for the lawyer. Um, now, this is sort of what the algorithm looks like. And the, the green column would represent the output. So this is what you'll be searching for, what you would like to know. So it could be future cash flows. It could be probability of repayment, um, it, but it could be any kind of thing you're interested in, you would wanna figure out. Um, now the, in, in that blue matrix, you see all the input variables of the model, right? So you could throw in everything you're able to find basically in terms of data about this person. So it could be a university degree, it could be a taste in music if you're able to quantify that, et cetera, et cetera. It could be anything you kind of feed into the algorithm, um, which is then going to come up um, with the output. Now, the, the yellow column represents the weight of the input variable, right? So for example, university degree might be twice as important as taste in music or the other way around, you never know. Um, and so, so these weights, this is what the algorithm is going to evaluate. Um, and then the, the beta zero just represents a value um, you, you wanna need in case those here should all be zero and you still don't wanna the output be to be zero. Now, um, if you think about, well, where, where do I come in as in I am the one who would like to get a credit. So every row of this represents basically one individual, right? Um, on which you will need to figure out the data and then feed it basically into the machine. And then you end up at a pretty simple, you know, with this pretty simple um, uh, column here, you know, that's what's happening. So it's not very, let's say, difficult to understand. Um, so if you are the person, Katja Langbuch, applying for credit, you'll be evaluated based on the input variables you hand over to the scoring agency, that's one option, or the scoring agency in whichever way will be able to figure out about you. Um, and so they'll associate the, the input variables with you in some way, and then the algorithm computes the output Y for you based on the values of beta and beta zero, which it previously established. Now, so, so what's good and what's bad about it? Um, and, and there I would like to spend a couple of minutes. Um, if I think back to myself, when I was first paid by a uni US university, and I thought it might be a good idea to open a bank account in the US. I tried a couple of banks before starting to ask friends. Um, and they all said, no, you know, you don't have any kind of credit score we need in order for you to open up a bank account with us. So that's the good part, right? I was totally credit invisible in the US, obviously, because all of my credit history was in Europe and in Germany. Now, um, obviously, that's just one of the credit invisible people, um, the, the more, let's say, joyful marketing, which is being made around algorithmic credit scoring, is that it has the potential to open up access, not only to payment, but also to credit for those who kind of don't fit into the traditional molds of credit scoring. 
So, and, and it's true, I, I'm, I'm not saying that this doesn't happen. I'm not saying that this is not maybe a promise which we need um, to, to understand and cherish. Um, it does happen. Um, and a lot of people have been pushing for that. I don't know to what extent you've followed the um, payment situation, which is the same and or the question of virtual currencies. And in all those worlds of fintech, so to speak, you always hear this argument. It's going to open access for the credit invisible or the unbanned um, spanning, you know, into developing countries all over the place. So that's the promise. And it's the good thing about it to keep in mind, especially because for the rest of the talk, I will be uh, focusing on the risks and of the, on the concerns um, algorithmic credit scoring entails. Um, so one of them obviously is data privacy, uh, which interests me, especially because being kind of in between the US and Europe, it's really interesting for me to compare the approaches to data protection um, uh, in Europe on the one hand and in the US on the other side. The same is true for fair lending and we'll have a look at mostly anti-discrimination doctrine in that area and I'll, I'll explain to you, I'll try to explain to you um, why this is a concern, especially with algorithmic credit scoring. Um, kind of both data privacy and for lending concerns lead into a question of explainability. Will I be able, if I'm the lender or the scorer, to explain to the borrower, to the person opening up their data, basically handing it over to either the lender or the scorer, what that means? Will I be able to explain to them how the algorithm works, what it means if suddenly the algorithm got fed in, for example, the data on a fitness tracking app or the taste in music or, or, or. And then lastly, as I've said before, um, I would like to think a bit about the institutional design of regulatory agencies, which have a look at both data protection and anti-discrimination and more, as we shall see. So let's, let's start with data privacy. Um, as you probably all know, the EU has a pretty different approach in terms of regulatory regime if compared to the US. And um, so the, the US at the same time is, is a very much evolving landscape. So for a long time, it was said and, and true um, that the GDPR, so the European regime, provided a much higher, let's say, level of data protection. In this area we're talking about, so in the credit scoring area, this is not necessarily true. Why is this not necessarily true? Because there is a focus piece of legislation, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which does have quite a bit of data protection. And we'll talk about it later also uh, as to what that implies for institutional design. Um, still, I, I would like to start with the EU. So the EU's GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, has what's called an omnibus approach. So what does that mean? It means that we start from a place where we say processing of data of any kind, for starters, is illegal. Unless, that's how the law thinks, unless there's an exemption which allows for data processing. So what does that mean if I'm the credit scoring agency or the bank lender, I will need to look for one of the exemptions which allow me to process the data I've got. So evidently consent is sort of the most natural exemption. And you will see with, as I said, we've looked through a couple of websites, um, most websites go down that road. They ask you to say, yes, please, I'm happy for you credit scorer to use my data because I would like to get a loan, right? Um, so consent is what we'll be looking at more closely, especially in the light of the European Court of Justice, who a couple of years ago decided that consent um, merits quite a number of closer looks. There's one court decision um, where you had an online game 
And so in order for you to carry on playing that game, you needed to consent to your data being used. And there the European Court of Justice said, well, this is not what we understand as consent, right? So that's one of the um, interesting things to keep in mind. Um, I don't know to what extent you, you've read the um, FT or whichever journal um, on what's happening in China with uh, Ant Financial, Jack Ma. Um, and interestingly enough, because this person is also engaged in what I'm trying to explain to you, or trying, you know, trying to present to you rather, um, algorithmic credit scoring. Now, this Jack Ma has a business model doing very similar things. And um, under the Chinese data protection law, which is actually really interesting, um, he can say, I don't want to hand over the data to the Chinese central bank. And apparently, me only relying on the um, FT journalists, um, that's what he said. And then the Chinese central bank said, well, you need to kind of put that together with consent. You will need to say to the people using your website, you can only do that if you consent and hand over the data. So it's really interesting, these different cultural approaches um, to what consent might be. Um, Moving on, uh, the GDBR has special safeguards for protected data, which is going to be interesting for us if we look at discrimination um, and thinking about explainability, thinking about will this person understand what it's doing when he or she hands over the data. There's a couple of articles in the GDPR um, on what type of information and data stored um, the scoring agency would need to provide, and also on the purpose of the processing. Now, if we quickly look to the US, um, I already said this, this specific piece of legislation, Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, now, the regime kind of starts from the other end of the spectrum. So it says, well, usually processing of data is legal unless a prohibition is applies, right? And so what, what, what about the prohibitions? It works the other way around kind of, you can use the data, but you need to make sure you're outside of prohibitions. And so those prohibitions in the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, or at least the regulation rather than a real prohibition, um, look for, are you a consumer reporting agency? Is what you're providing a consumer report? And if so, you need a permissible purpose for handing over the data to a third party. So interestingly enough, not for what you do with the data, but if you hand it over to a third party. Um, if this is the case, if you qualify under that legislation, consumers have rights to access information. And also um, one of the ideas behind the Fair Credit Reporting Act is to explain to you why, if you applied for credit, you didn't get it, right? And that has to do with the explainability larger doctrine, um, which interestingly enough in the GDPR, some of it is in there, but not with the same background idea, right? Because that has to do with the fact that the GDPR has this idea of prohibiting everything and then having exemptions. So the explainability doesn't figure as prominently as it does in the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So that's the first issue I wanted to explain to you, data protection. The second one is much more complicated, but also much more interesting, I feel. And um, I'm using an example, uh, which is a, a, an existing company called Upstart. Now, Upstart, uh, as you see, has this nice kind of appealing website where it says, oh, we're different and you, you are more than your credit score, which I liked reading when I was trying to apply for my bank account there. And um, it tells you, just give us a bit of data about you. And it's actually not that much Upstart asks. Um, and then you will see that you will get credit through us via us. So um, that's what they did. And then um, they were still kind of worried whether that might lead to discrimination. Why was that the case? Because among the data they were looking for were colleges and universities, which the potential borrower had attended. 
Now, for a Scottish um, audience, it's probably not as um, surprising um, and even less for a US audience um, if compared to a continental European audience, how closely um, universities and colleges attended correlate with a number of things amongst which later success in life and also race, religion, um, background in a lot of financial respects, et cetera. So with this in mind, I have a quick look at this um, profile. So the source of this study is um, uh, an NGO in New York, um, the Student um, Protection Borrower Center. So what they did is they created three, let's say, fake profiles um, of people who seem to be applying for credit via Upstart. So they were identical in all respects. So they were all apparently majors in computer science. Um, they were all financial analysts. They had the same annual income. The only thing which was different about these three different fake profiles was that the first person um, graduated from New York University, the second one from Howard University, which for those who are not familiar, um, is a black elite university, a mainly black elite university, and the last one from New Mexico State University, which is a primarily Hispanic serving institution. And as you see, there was a huge threat, right? So the New Mexico State University person, which as I say was, was a fake profile, which just to show whether to figure out whether there might be discrimination going on, um, had a penalty to pay and even more the person who seemed to be coming from Howard University. You know, that might have been in the back of the mind of Upstart when it applied for so-called no action letter. And now that no action letter interests me again with my background uh, interest in institutional design. Because the no action letter is um, an instrument, let's say, which a regulatory authority offers to give comfort basically to such a thing as upstart that yes or no, it considers um, what they're doing as problematic or as okay. And in this case, the regulatory agency was the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, some of you might know that this is a pretty new agency in the US um, built basically after the model of Elizabeth Warren, which again, some of you might know because she had been running for president um, also. Now, um, what did they do? So they said, this is our data. We understand that if we're looking or asking potential borrowers to hand us over data on which college and or university they attended, there might be discrimination kind of an issue in the room. So they apply to the CFPB with their data. The CFPB has a lot of interest in literature actually um, on that, uh, which you can download for free from the internet for those who are interested. Um, and they figured out that the people applying via Upstart would be getting better scores basically on top of the traditional score, which in the US is called FICO. So what happened is that all the people which would have gotten credit under the traditional score still got credit. But on top of that, basically, more people got credit. So that was kind of the good news, right? Remember we said, well, there's promises. More people are getting credit. So that was kind of the, the, the nice side of the picture. The not so nice side was that the closer you looked, the more you saw that there was still at least unequal treatment. So people were, yes, getting more, but still, if you look through races, um, Blacks were getting, comparatively speaking, less than Asians, 
Asians, less than whites, etc. So there was still something going on. And we will, as we move along, we will discuss to what extent that's worrisome or not. Um, the CFPP ended up issuing the no action letter. So it accepted the argument from Upstart that this was not discriminatory because in the end, everybody um, got more than under the traditional system. Now, um, th this is for those who are really interested in discrimination doctrine. I understand there's a lot of stuff on this slide and um, I, don't worry, uh, you know, if I'll, I'll be boring you only for a couple of minutes, I hope, um, although I'm really excited about all of this. So, so let's just uh, figure out what we're talking about. Um, of course, if I say I train my algorithm to look specifically for gender or race or religion. We all agree probably that there's a problem with discrimination. So um, that would be direct discrimination in European terminology and then intentional um, disparate treatment in, in US terminology. And so under a European law, we have a number of anti-discrimination directives most of them focus on an employment context, but some of them are broader. Um, that's the first thing a European lawyer would look to. The second and much more complicated thing a European um, lawyer would, would think about is um, to what extent does the European Court of Justice accept that fundamental human rights have an impact on private law? So that would be a second venue to go down. And then of course, there's a number of regimes of member states laws. Um, now in the US, there's a second piece of legislation specifically targeting credit scoring and access to credit. Um, and this is the Equal Credit Opportunities Act, as you can see down there. Um, what you have to prove there is you're not discriminating, so no discriminatory treatment. Um, there's where the uh, one of the explainability issues comes in. So um, it requires you to explain why the loan request was denied, if it was so. And there's also some civil liability involved. Now, but I already said, well, if I train the model to specifically look for race, most of us will say, well, of course, any other problem. What's much more difficult, and I'll think back to the math slide, is all those correlations, right? All the data, all the variables you feed in and all the correlations gonna come up with. And this creates a problem of what Europeans call indirect discrimination. US terminology usually talks about disparate impact. So what does that mean doctrinally speaking? It means you have a facially neutral rule but it's still in its application, it creates a disadvantage for certain groups. Now, under EU, and it's pretty similar actually, EU, US over there, under the EU, it's an accepted general principle. We have it in a number of these anti-discrimination directives. There's quite a bit of ECJ jurisprudence about it. Um, what does it do? Well, you need to define two groups. You need to sort of fix a disparity you can bear. Um, and then you would move on to understand whether the fact that you're treating two groups in a different way um, will be justified by maybe a legitimate aim and appropriate and necessary, that's the terminology of the ECJ, means. I said sort of similarly under the US, once you accept that it applies that doctrine, which the Supreme Court has only done so far for housing and employment, but not for credit scoring, um, a number of agencies and some courts are suggesting it, but there's no real, let's say, authority on it by the Supreme Court, yes. But once you've accepted it, um, then it would be moving in a similar way. Um, you would also define the two groups. You would also need to fix an acceptable disparity. And then you would also need to ask, well, is there maybe an alternative practice um, and uh, which would lead to less discriminatory results? And in the US, you look for a manifest business necessity, which again, I'll, I'll have a couple of thoughts later on what a business necessity could be. Just a, a quick look also, again, at kind of the math for lawyers, why can't we just outlaw using the variable race? That seems like the most evident and natural 
um, answer to this whole problem, right? And you see discussions about that, not only in the credit scoring area, there's also in the criminal justice system, there's um, discussions about it as to employment, there's discussions about it. So it seems so easy, you would think, but if you look closer, it's not, of course, because if you kind of want to outlaw this um, variable, you, you have to divide up your variables, you know, into the ones which are correlated with race, not correlated with race, and then race itself, so to speak. And um, if you remove all the race variables in itself and the correlated ones, then um, a couple of studies have shown that really all in the US studies, I have to say, almost all variables correlate with race. Um, and so many people said, well, it's kind of um, a balance between accuracy and fairness. And the more you remove, the less the algorithm is going to help you understand what you would like to understand. So I've covered quite a bit of what I wanted to cover and um, we can now move on to, as I said, which is kind of my current area of interest, which is institutional design. And again, I, um, why do I think this is interesting? I think it does go back to the fact that I've been teaching both in the US and in Germany and that the institutional design is so very different in those countries. Now, we, I already told you that there are these targeted specific pieces of legislation in the US, the FECRA and the COA. And that corresponds with the fact that you have quite a number of regulatory agencies which are trained in finance, so to speak. So we've, we've already talked about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau with the no action letter issued for Upstart. Um, then there's the Federal Trade Commission, there's the um, Office of Financial Research, which I'll talk about later, which is not a regulatory agency in the narrow sense. So, but there's um, regulatory agencies which kind of know finance, right? And they have competence in understanding um, banking, credit, lending, and all of that. Now, if you compare this to, for example, Germany, and for most European countries, this is going to look similar. You have Buffin, which um, is our SEC, so to speak, but is also our um, banking regulatory supervisory authority. Now, Buffin might look, once it's screening banks, whether a bank in its lending business is going to obey the law. But it's really unclear whether it has a jurisdiction at all to check for anti-discrimination or data protection. It's basically going to see, well, others are going to take care of that. So really the only regulatory authority which has any competence really in financial issues is probably not going to look for it because there are data protection authorities um, anti-discrimination places, courts for anti-discrimination, et cetera, but no specific regulatory agency as is the case in the United States. Now the data protection authorities obviously look for data protection problems, but they don't have the specific competence in finance and lending and payment, et cetera. So here you have the problem that um, they are kind of in charge, but probably they don't know enough. And the problem with anti-discrimination under the EU regime is, at least in Germany and a number of countries I've looked at, there is no, let's say, regulatory agency. There are kind of ombudsman places, stuff like that, but no real regulatory agency. So usually you would go to courts. Um, and here, of course, it's kind of a case by case decision to what extent a court is going to say, yes, this is discriminatory or not. Um, and of course the court has enough competence in lending and finance and stuff, but it still to me seems a much more complicated institutional design rather than having specific agencies with um, a knowledge and a team working in the financial and, and lending area. So this brings me to my last slide already for those um, <laughs> who are already growing impatient. Now, um, what, are the, what are the next steps I would like to consider 
um, thinking about inward death. The first thing um, that's for European scholarship is to think about the GDPR regime, so the general data protection regime. Um, and, and interestingly enough, just yesterday I read in the paper that um, that is what the EU Commission is planning to refine it and, and figure out to what extent this old, it's only a couple of years old, but um, this old regime works well enough um, under new technology and new situations. So we will definitely need to understand what consent means, whether we can refine the concept of consent. Will we allow for example, such a thing as the Chinese central bank had envisaged to say, well, you can only use my website if you consent. Or do we stick with the cultural reservations the European Court of Justice had voiced when it said, no, um, you can't link those two things. This is not good enough for giving consent. Is consent, if, you, if you're moving more towards the data protection world of scholars, is consent really a useful um, instrument anymore for data protection. If we think about all the tick the box exercises you have to do on every single website, are we not all kind of growing tired of that anyway and just, yeah, 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 check the box. So is consent a good instrument at all? Um, and, and still under the data protection regime, what do we need to provide for? So in the text of the GDPR, you find um, the need to provide information on the purpose of the processing. But what does that mean? Is that something we can read along the lines of explainability in the US terms? So does this entail not only saying, I'm using your data for the purpose of scoring you, is, it, is there more behind it kind of? Um, do, do we also ask the scorer, well, I don't, that's not enough for me. I don't only want to know that you're using it for scoring. I want to know more. I want to know why I didn't get this or that score. Or maybe even I want to know how your model works. So under the GDPR, there's almost nothing on that. There's some um, different member states will have different laws possibly on top of the GDPR. Uh, just to give you an example again from Germany, we had a couple of years ago, um, a decision by our highest court where potential borrowers were suing a scoring, one of the traditional scoring agencies with the claim that they wanted to know the model because before a couple of studies had found, interestingly enough, sort of like along the things I've shown you for Upstart, that people with really similar profiles, except gender, were getting totally different scores. And interestingly enough there, it was um, discrimination against young men. So young men, I, I think if I have it in my mind correctly, be, be, between 20s and 30s, were getting much worse scores than young women in the same age bracket. So, so what does that entail? What well, GDPR, can we understand better what that is? Um, and to what extent we can read some sort of explainability into it? Or do we need to move further? The second um, more global issue really, because it depends less, I feel, um, on the individual pieces of legislation is how to understand indirect discrimination or disparate impact doctrine. Uh, so of course, with the legitimate aim, there's quite a number of things we need to understand. Um, one thing I hear over and over and over again, if I present this topic to all kinds of audiences is, well, why should a bank care? Why is it the business of the bank to write discrimination. It has nothing to do with that, right? So this is something we need to understand to what extent we feel that a private actor such as a lender has some sort of obligation to not discriminate and I'm focusing on indirect discrimination. So it's not about overt intentional, I don't like you because of your gender. It's the indirect part. It's the fact that once they use their model, they figure out later that interestingly, under their model, certain protected groups get treated differently. 
So the same model, as we saw in the example of Upstart, ends up asking for a much higher price if you attended a Black university than if you attended a, let's say, not primarily Black university, such as NYU. So is this something which should bother us? Or should we say, well, this is just the way the world is? And there's other things we need to do to right discrimination. We cannot, um, let's say, charge private actors with that tax. And along those same lines, we need to figure out whether a look at financial stability is an even bigger concern if we would like to, let's say, go ahead with the claim that at least some indirect discrimination should be um, showered, so to speak, by um, private actors. Because how about the following argument, which again, I've heard over and over again. Um, obviously, regulatory agencies will need to make sure that financial stability is guaranteed. Now, the more we are um, requiring from banks to take on loans which are worse under their new model than the ones they would like to take on board, the more we're endangering financial stability. And the same argument you could make with shareholder value. Of course, the shareholders of a bank, of a lender, will be interested in having only those loans which look good under the model, right? And I haven't um, talked at all because unfortunately we only have those 40 minutes um, about what's uh, called historic bias. Maybe we can do that um, during the, the Q&A session um, which ensues to, to feed even more into why indirect discrimination is happening so often. And um, that has to do with the data we're feeding in with how the model learns. And as I say, I'm, I'm happy to go into that more deeply. Um, however, uh, I wanted to end with um, uh, a glance at um, institutional design, notably the question, what do we require from our uh, regulatory authorities? What could they do to contribute to kind of a fairer, better, more responsible scoring? Um, so can they and how can they check the data and the model quality? Um, and maybe that's something I've heard only a couple of weeks ago at another conference, and I thought it's a really interesting idea. Um, could we maybe make an argument for establishing kind of one centralized office, um, which is collecting the entire financial data? Um, and and that the, the young researcher, she, she's a US researcher, has made that a, suggestion says, well, in the US, we have the Office of Financial Research. And why not build it up to be a large, you know, um, regulatory agency, which just collects everything, all the data, and interestingly enough, all the manpower. Because this is also something which regulatory agencies across the board grapple with to get kind of the good and competent people. And in data, um, in the data world, it's the same, of course. Um, typical Silicon Valley uh, companies will pay considerably more um, than the public regulatory agencies. So um, is this something, is, is looking at institutional design something which we should try, especially from a European perspective? Is there something to learn from the fact that the US has a distributed um, setup, so to speak, with regulatory authorities with a specific knowledge in the financial area? Or would we go ahead with our traditional approach of saying, no, we'll just have across the board regulatory agencies such as in data protection um, and they'll need to figure it out somehow. So thank you very much. Um, so far, so good. <laughs> um, I'll stop the screen sharing now and I'm really looking forward to discussing this with you.